you'd be surprised by like how much people will actually tell you if you show that you're willing to listen and that you care. Episode 95. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I've got the privilege of speaking to Danny Cesario, who is the 333rd black female architect in American history. Originally, she's from Manchester, uh, and at an early age, she became enamored with the city of New York and its intricacies and architectural prestige. She's an internationally licensed architect, both RABA and AIA. She's a project manager and public speaker, and she's equipped with exceptional communication and organizational skills, and she has been working for SOM um, as a, an associate there, leading dynamic mixed-use development, healthcare, and wellness projects. Danny has served as the chair of the AIA New York's Diversity and Inclusion Committee for over five years, and currently she serves on the AIA New York State Board, representing nearly 10,000 members across 13 chapters. And she's also the founder of Wallen Plus Daub, which is a space to educate through shared information and experiences as a place to share diverse stories, to empower others and to help retain talent through engagement. So in this conversation with Danny, um, we discuss about her role as a project manager and the business aspects that she deals with in facilitating some of SOM's major projects. And we also talk about building an inclusive environment for your team, for your business, and your business culture as a whole. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Danny Cesario. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK discovery call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Danny, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show. How are you in New Jersey? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, great. So it's really fascinating and brilliant to have you on the show. You're uh, a licensed architect, you're a project manager, manager, SOM, you're a public speaker, you're involved in the AIA uh, with diversity and, in and inclusion, and you're also the founder of Wallum and Daub. So there's a lot of different avenues to your experience and your career. And I think what would be really great for us to discuss is, is this idea of inclusion and creating a business culture around in inclusivity and what that means mm -hmm. for you and how businesses can establish that. So I guess the first question is, is just to, to hear a little bit about, about you and how you got started in, in architecture. Okay, so um, my love of architecture started around the time I was six years old. Um, and at the time we were living in South East London and there was a church called Church Rise um, that I would pass every day on the way to school and I'd ask my mom, you know, all about it. She didn't know. I mean, my, my granddad is a mason. My, my dad is an engineer. So I understood like that sort of things, them sort of tinkering in the back garden. Um, but where the art and the engineering and the design sort of crossed paths is something that wasn't as familiar to me. So my mom made it a priority to 
find every book that she could and take me to the library and like other examples of, of houses of that time period or buildings of that time period. So it became, I think that was my first um, foray into walking tours and like going and visiting architecture up close and personal. And did you study in the UK or in the US? I did my undergraduate in the US um, and I did high school and primary school in both places, US and in England. And what, what brought you to New York? Was it always New York or was it other other parts? It was always like New York and then I think later on it became New Jersey in America. We never lived, we, we never really veered too far off the East Coast. <laughs> um, but um, my, what brought me to America was my, my mom and my dad. My dad worked for Canon and Kodak, which were like international companies. So it was relatively easy to get transferred. And um, my mom's English, my dad's American. So it was always about sort of, living in both places and my brother sister and I just sort of being really adaptable as we moved along you got preference which one do you prefer (laughs) do you know what I'm really torn and I think it's gotten to the point now that I've been in America so long and so consistently that I have laid down roots here like I own a home here and it's I think it's going to be a lot more difficult this time to sort of pick up and move Mm. Um, than it was previously but I, I do like to travel I do like to go home I've, I've started in recent years to go home more often um, there was a stint of like seven years where I hadn't gone back and I've really tried not to let that happen again mm. and I think especially now having my own sort of family and like having my children understand where I'm coming from and why I sound the way I do and why you know I make certain foods <laughs> And uh, certain turns of phrases, I think it's really important for them to meet my family in Manchester and in London and, and all of that. So, And is there a cultural difference in terms of like the architectural industry in the UK and in the US? And this is something I'm always fascinated to hear because I, mean, I speak to lots of architects in the US as well as, as, well as Britain. How, what has been your experience? I've never practiced in England, actually. Um, and that's something that I do have on my, my bucket career list, um, a career bucket list. Um, but I am licensed to practice in, in England. I do notice, though, like with my colleagues at SOM who do, um, do practice in the UK, it's just a very different approach, I think. Like, I think English people tend to be a lot more... Um, and I don't want to overgeneralize too much, but I think America tends to be a lot faster. Like I noticed in terms of my education, America tends to be a lot more fast paced and very like competitive. And I'm not saying that England isn't that way, but I think there's a certain um, fire for a lack of a better <laughs> term. There's a certain there's a certain sort of bluntness that goes along with, I think the American approach that English people just don't really do Mm. as much. I think we tend to sort of be very polite and tiptoe around things. It's less of a directness. Um, I think that that's sort of changing as our practices and as our world becomes a lot more international, a lot more global. I think that we're borrowing from each other a lot more. Um, I think in terms of education, though, England has the part one, two, and three, which I think as an architect has a a really interesting element to it where you're not just sort of condoned, you're cordoned off to just doing the educational side Mm -hmm. um, as you sort of do here. There's much more work practice and like um, sort of like job experience, like work experience. When you're 16 in England, you go and like work in the field or work in an office for a few weeks of the field that you're most interested in. I didn't find that that was the case here, you know? Um, We also have A-levels and things like that. So in your last two years between um, 16 and 18, you get to sort of become more specific in where you want to focus your studies. Mm. Um, I think having that broken down from just sort of a generalist uh, approach to all education and then honing in on what you're most interested in is really valuable, especially as you're going and investing in your undergraduate education. I, I've always quite admired the American system for that, actually, because it doesn't force you to focus so narrowly 
um, until later on. So like for, am I right in thinking that in, as in architecture, you, you don't necessarily have to do a degree in architecture, but it's much more like law where you can have studied something else and then do a master's in architecture and then become qualified. You, you can go down that road. Um, is, I don't, is it the same in England or no? No, you, sort of, you, you typically uh, have to do your, you know, your degree in architecture and then you know, that's, that's your part one accreditation and then you do your year out and then you do your two years masters, which is solely architecture, but it tends to be a long time just in architecture. It's the same here. So I've done the Bachelor of Architecture, which is the five-year pre-professional degree. So if I wanted to go and get a master's, there are certain graduate universities where I could do that in like a year um, and be, you know, fully able to like go and take my exams and all of that. You can do that with the five-year degree. Mm. Um, I think if you're coming from a different professional background or different educational background it takes you a bit longer at the master's level it could take three years you might have to do some sort of supplementary work in between right. um and that's like four years plus the three so that could be seven years i think altogether, though education wise and experience wise it takes about seven years which is very comparable to parts one two and three yeah. before you can really like sit for your exams and like have enough of an experiential background to lend that to the exams do you know what i mean yeah um, yeah and and in your own career so what, tell us a little bit about your current role at som and your kind of career career progression from university into into practice so i am um, i I always worked during university and I think that in a lot of ways working relatively early on while getting my education helped me to stay because it, it, it made me understand how what I was learning at university translated into actual um, knowledge that I could lend to a painter job mm. so I started out in an expediting firm that wasn't far from my university I went to City College and the the alumni there is it's that you can meet somebody from City College almost anywhere and they're super supportive and 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 so I in so doing I was able to like secure my first job so expediting if you're not familiar is more like the um, filing the filing of jobs at the Department of Buildings, um, getting permits, that sort of thing. So I got to understand zoning. I got to understand all of the different city agencies and, mm. you know, get comfortable with what was required of us in a legal sense so, for architecture. So is that the equivalent of, of working within a local authority, essentially? Is that you're in a, in a company? Or I wasn't a working in a company. I was okay. working in a company that would then represent... Um, a architecture firm or an engineering firm to get the required permits. So it, it helped me to understand um, all of the different facets of how you could lend your architectural knowledge mm. to a profession. Um, but, you know, that was while I was still in school. Um, I After I graduated, I started working for Jacobs Engineering, which is a relative big E, little a, you'd call it, um, engineering firm. And again, because I wasn't, in a traditional architecture firm, it was interesting to see how my education could translate into, um, at the time it was Jacob's relatively small um, architecture division. So it was called GBNA. And um, there I was working on Amtrak projects and um, American Girl, like uh, retail facilities as well. And I, I liked, I really liked institutional work. That was where I sort of mm. fell in love with the idea of architecture that actually, that wasn't just sort of like ornate, but that actually helped. Um, when I compared my American Girl projects to the Amtrak projects, we were doing like nationwide um, ADA upgrades to all of the stations and trying to create a prototype for them. So working in transportation, um, was of, of real interest to me. And as I went through other jobs, I, that was something that I really took with me. I was mostly interested in schools in more like public architecture and eventually fell into healthcare architecture, which is what I've done for the past five years until more recently. Um, and now at SRM, I'm working on large scale um, 
large scale multi-use or mixed use developments. For instance, Manhattan West is one of my main projects. And over there now I'm a project manager. So I've also been working in project management for around the same amount of time. Mm. And it focuses on, I, I think it's more like the business of architecture, no, no pun intended, but we really help push forward the design and the scope and what we've sort of agreed upon with our clients and making sure that the end product is something that we're, you know, profitable from, really proud of and really sticks to our ethos as designers. So less of your role is actually drafting and you're much more on the coordination aspects of the project i was always quite keen on the coordination so before being a becoming a project manager i was a project architect Mm. um so i was in the field a lot working on construction and administration and working with the um, contractors as well as the clients and in the oac meetings just making sure again that what we initially drafted was translated in its built form and that our interested our interests our contracts and so on were being followed through to the end um in tra- in going over to the project management side i it became a lot more about like the finance and supporting the design through still representing the firm but doing so in a way that was less tied to the everyday design you know, I, I haven't, I don't draft so much anymore. This is really uh, very fascinating, actually, because it sounds like the, your, the, the role here is much more people-based and communication-based. Um, and obviously, in those kind of large, complex infrastructure projects, there is, you know, you're often dealing with complex, multi-headed corporate clients. There's going to be lots mm-hmm. of different people to be presenting. There's a whole load of different um, things to choreograph if you like, mm-hmm. from, from finances to you know, delivery of the drawings to making sure the different stakeholders have got uh, as the information that they need. How did you, what, what would you say are, are the most sort of challenging aspects of this role and how does it differentiate from, how do you work with the architects? What are the differences between the project manager and the architects? Okay. Essentially. Okay. All right. So I would say that the difference between the project managers and the architects is it's more about the perspective that you're approaching the project from. Um, Being that I am an architect, I do definitely care about the design. And so I think I'm able to sort of straddle both lines. I would say that the most difficult element of my role is the juggling because you definitely want the design to be at the forefront. Mm. You want the client's needs to be met. You want the project to be profitable. And you also want to be able to effectively track what the timeline is going to be. And I'm sure we've like heard the sayings like, oh, you can have two of the three. You can't have it good, fast and cheap and that sort of thing. Um, So yeah, I think that it's the difference between um, the project manage. It's more of an extension, I would say. Mm. Um, project management is, I think, an extension of the architecture. I think it needs to be, particularly in our field. Um, you can't really abandon the design for the purposes of your scope and your money and, and so on. But I'm also very conscientious of that as I'm drawing up a contract and really speaking with my team about how long they think it's going to actually take Mm. um, to do a study, to do a full soup to nuts design. And I'm usually quite keen where it's possible to try and tuck in a bit more time for us because I realize that the coordination element, especially from my experience of working in the field, if you don't take the time to do that at some point and like track it and really make space for it you end up doing it on the back end anyway Mm. and it's always worse to try and coordinate something as it's trying as it's being built than it is to put the thought in put an extra few weeks in and you know make sure that we're able to still keep people keep the client engaged as well as keeping the team you know going in a a useful way (laughs) What, what sorts of things do you measure in order to keep or keep a project profitable from the from the SOM side? I would say um, time over money. I mean, there's different, different um, 
I guess, formulas that you can use to figure out like what's profitable and what's not. Um, because we are in the, it is a business at the end of the day. The thing with architects is that we would do it for free. And my, <laughs> my job is that is to make sure that we, we don't end up doing that. Um, I think that our clients nowadays are more sophisticated than ever. Yeah. And they're, they're, you know, they know what they want. They know what they want their outcomes to be. And they have a, a sense of how much things should cost them. So it's about presenting value to them. You know, not just, okay, this is, this is what our number is and this is for how long, but more presenting our proposals is this is what you would get from us. This is how we're thinking forward. This is how we're um, considering where you want to be and how you want your building to reflect on the overall landscape of, you know, it, its site, its neighborhood and mm. things like that. Um, so those are definitely things that I, I measure. Not, not just what our budget is, but also the level of engagement. And I think for me, it may take a little bit um, of a longer time because I'm thinking very deeply about like what my, the people on my team, um, what their goals are. I mean, I, I think when you're an emerging professional, it's really important for you to not work on the same six typologies back to back to back mm. it's really important for everybody to get to flex what they already know and have some some leeway to learn new things as well um so in staffing our projects i always i always take that into consideration and you know also stack, stacking the team in a way that there are there's a range and a diversity of experience um as well so that it's uh, it's a bit of like an internship if you get to work on a project. Got it. You know, so this is yeah. quite a, a, a multi-faceted role where you're coordinating, choreographing the actual team who's going to be mm -hmm. in the project, um, ensuring that the project is run profitably, so keeping whatever checks and processes you need to do in that, and also in, you're involved in the proposal process. Right? Yeah. Um, and what's involved in the proposal process? I think it's about, it's a bit like advertising, you know, um, one of the more, more recent proposals that I've done has been a new age of timber um, and sustainably, sustainably based project. And um, it's a, it's an existing city it's thriving there's a lot going on and i think that there's this want to maintain cultural identity at the same time as being innovative so what's packed into the proposals like that is a lot of research of the area that we're planning on working on understanding where the clients are sort of coming from what they've worked on in the past showcasing what we've done that's similar and also like the range of where we've done those sorts of projects in mm. just to really put forth like our, our ability to be adaptable, but also still regardless of where we are geographically bring a product that's like really high quality, a building that's really high quality. That's, you know, properly activated that sort of thing. And then we also have to tuck in our CVs like the, that, uh, the, what the roster of the group is, what they've worked on in the past, what their specialties are, how they're also involved in other community driven um, organizations um, or professional organizations. We also include, of course, our fee, our timeline. Um, but I think the biggest piece, like when I'm working on a proposal, the piece I tend to focus in a lot on is the scope and the timeline and how that's going to be broken down. And when we intend to have face-to-face -face meetings with the client and so on. Because I think most of our clients nowadays definitely want to be part of the creative process. Yeah. Not so much that, I, I try and make it so that it's understood you know, that we're not going to be micromanaged through the whole process because they are approaching us as professionals at SOM who, you know, our firm's 80 plus years. Like, I think it's clear that we have uh, experience and we understand what's expected of us. Mm. But at the same time that we definitely want their input at key stages along the way 
to help us like work on the des design together. And I think that that collaborative approach and creating that relationship where our clients can come to us and say, all right, this is not really what we were thinking or no, this is definitely in line with what they were, we were thinking and it not being like a three month period in between really helps because you instill trust. Mm. And when you do that, I realize that, um, when you get to the construction process, when you've got a lot of other stakeholders, you've got the contractors in and so on, the client is more apt to remember the kind of conversations you've had in the past and the journey that you've gotten to before you got in front of all of these other folks at the OAC meeting yep. and remember that and at the very least give you the benefit of the doubt when you know things tend to become a lot more terse. How, how is it structured at SOM? Is it do you have um, offices in most international cities or is it just based in Manhattan? I know you guys are an international you know you've got you've got a pretty wide portfolio of of work and of offices around the world correct or yeah we do um we have offices in almost 10 different cities our home office was chicago um I th that was where we started off right and our main office like my office right now is one of the larger ones so we have about 400 people in the new york office and um our offices in Asia are a little bit smaller, but we're still able to pull out, to push out, I should say. Um, really impressive work. Even in our offices of 300, 400, 300 to 400 people, um, I see that there are different studios, there are different, you know, work groups, different directors, and the directors with their um, their teams, they have relationships have worked on different projects so and I, I also like seeing that as well like people who've worked together for the past five years in different capacities mm. and like that sort of growth um I think it helps to see to feel for the it helps for the office to not feel um out of scale do you know what I mean yeah so is so, so it broken up on the inside of of like lots of smaller studios that are all project-based or is it, you know, the, are teams allocated to work on one project at a time? Or do you have little studio clusters where perhaps there's a group of people who are working on three or four different projects? Yeah, it, it, I don't think it's as um, sort of cut and dry as that. Like right. it, it tends to be a lot more fluid. So I know that, for instance, on one of my projects, there's, I have one director across three different projects, right? So the teams are very similar. And I, I think if you drew a, a Venn diagram of all of the different, I think the four different projects that I'm working on, you'd see similar groups of people, you know, working together on some projects and then on others. So it tends to be quite um, flexible, but I know that SOM is really vested in, creating those relationships within like internally mm. within SOM and also with the clients. Like we're not really as apt to, you know, just throw people onto projects who may not have been part of the very beginning and stuff like that. I think it does. I've worked in firms where that happens. I don't think it's the best way possible. And again, going back to the proposal and sort of figuring out what the roster of the team is going to be early on. I think that that really helps. Like who's going to be sort of, um, client facing who's going to be the main point of contact with the client versus you know who who the people are that are doing more of the uh more I, I wouldn't say like back of house development but who are the people who are doing the like the drawing the drafting the rendering that sort of thing mm. and the hope is that the client will get a level of familiarity with everybody that's on the team so our teams tend to be anywhere from like you know three people to 15 people so right. you can you can imagine how that divvies up based on the scale based on the time frame um across almost 400 people in the new york office alone and then we also work like across offices right and obviously yeah. you you know if you've as a practice that's been around for 80 years there's going to be a, a large number of repeat clients yeah um, how do you win new clients so does that still something that you're very much actively involved in where you're trying to you know, win new work? Is it lots of complex framework agreements that you need to get onto or how do you get Again, work? I think it goes back to juggling. I, I've seen examples before I got to the SOM office of 
people whose entire firm was just sort of based on repeat clients. Um, but I think, again, going back to this idea of our clients being more sophisticated mm. and more knowledgeable in what we do than ever um, and wanting to see innovation, I don't think there are as many clients nowadays that want to see the same thing that you did in the 80s. Do you know what I mean? And I think it's always important as a as a firm, I think as creatives to really push ourselves to go beyond what we've done in the past, still sticking to those like morals, still sticking to um, our values for sure, but definitely allowing ourselves to grow as well. And I think that that's usually spurred by um, creating new relationships. So as you mentioned, I'm really active in AIA in like professional organizations and so on. So I think being in those spheres allows different sorts of collaborations, mm -hmm. different conversations, and that's what usually leads to new work. I think also putting ourselves out there as the forefront as thought leaders through articles and so on um, also attracts new clients. But it, it's never a case of, all right, it was really great working with you lot for the past, you know, 20 years, We've, we're moving on. It's never, it's never like that. It's more about honing the relationships that we have, watching those evolve, and also creating new opportunities and new relationships in the places that we go. I've seen projects come out of, you know, people being on holiday and just speaking very casually about what they do. And it turns out that it's a developer. Um, I've also seen cases where people have seen articles that we've been a part of or we've, we've lended our knowledge to, mm. and that creates a new opportunity for us as well. But it's, I think the most, the most prosperous architecture firms, just like with any business, are the ones that are seeking new opportunities all the time at the same time as being able to stick to their values that they've become mm. known for. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting as well. You, you start, you mentioned there as well, you know, your work with uh, the AIA and we were, we were discussing earlier about, uh, you know, being in a sort of ambassador for inclusivity and diversity. And when we're talking about large architectural organizations and how they foster that kind of culture, because obviously, and, and also you were saying how uh, it's important to get a kind of breadth of experience on, on, onto a team and to really be you know you've got to be really aware of how you're nurturing your team because it's easy how, what, what are the sort of time frames on a project we're talking like sort of five years to 10 15 year long type things or not as oh goodness i think the manhattan west project i've seen things that date back about 10 years ago and you know we we are we are in construction now so it really just depends on the scale of a building. I've worked on studies at SOM that are like six week studies. So it's more about, in, in that case, it's more about looking at the possibilities and all of the different potentials of what a project could be. But then when you become, when you enter the um, schematic design, I would say, and you're moving out of the conceptual, but really realizing this building, um, that can take anywhere from three years to 10 to 15. It really just depends on the scale mm. of the building that we're working on and the complexity. You know, if you're, if you're doing everything from civil, like if your scope includes everything from civil engineering to, um, you know, just basic architecture and all of the other MEP elements as well, of course, that's going to take more time. Something that's 50 odd floors and, you know, over train tracks and things like that, like the Moynihan station that we're working on, um, it's going to take longer as well because you're working with different municipalities, you're working with government agencies from DOB, DOT, and all of those things have to be factored in along the way mm. um, with our design. So, uh, so in terms of, uh, are you, are you kind of, do you like to break up teams mid project or do you like people kind of, if, if somebody's kind of getting pigeonholed into uh, working on one thing, does that ever happen or how do you kind of, how, how, it how, hasn't how, so much. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you, how do you okay. keep, how do you keep the, the culture like nurturing the team? I think by listening to them. Um, I think if you, when you create an environment you you mentioned creating an environment where people can sort of be represented and like hearing diff diverse voices um which was a, a major part of what we did through aia diversity and inclusion when i was co-chair there um it's it's about hearing people out 
I think, for one, and creating a space where people feel like they can talk about things freely. I think if you present to your team, to your client, to your co, you know, your colleagues, that you're receptive to listening, that you have uh, ideas that are worthy of being heard and that you want to share, I think it just creates an environment for conversation to occur. Mm. And you'd be surprised by like how much people will actually tell you if you show that you're willing to listen and that you care. You know, um, I know that my approach to project management is not necessarily what everybody else might be keen on, but I think for me and my level of investment in my teams and in mm. our our buildings and so on. I really want it to be a case where, you know, the client feels like they can call us and just say, listen, this, this last meeting didn't go the way that like even having the tough conversations, I think it's important to show people your willingness to even sift through those. Or if you're working with the same person on a project that's similar to the last two that you've done, just saying to them, okay, I know that in your review, you mentioned that you wanted to work on more you know, transportation projects versus educational projects. Um, I think it's important to hear them out and see what they're, they're feeling. If there's a level of frustration that they're experiencing, mm. um, listening to them and also providing them with uh, tools and feedback that can help them out of that like frustrated state, I found to be really useful. Mm. When people are engaged overall, Ryan, I found that uh, you, you are able to garner a lot more from them. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.